occupational respiratory disease is relatively common and you are very likely to encounter it during your time training. Epidemiological studies suggest that the population attributable fraction of occupational factors in the mortality and morbidity of certain diseases is far from negligible. Occupational factors are frequently underreported. The patient may have left work years before symptoms develop. They may not connect their symptoms with their job or actually be trying to cover up that they're getting symptoms in relation to work. It's imperative the physician takes a thorough occupational history. If caught early, disease may be preventable in the individual and action can be taken to prevent ill health in co-workers. There is a legal requirement under a law with the acronym RIDOR to report certain occupational diseases to the Health and Safety Executive. This is an independent regulatory body responsible for workplace health and safety. In addition, there is a voluntary National Occupational Health Surveillance Scheme known as THOR. This stands for the Health and Occupation Research Network, which relies on the participation of about 6,000 doctors with expertise in occupational health. A thorough respiratory occupational history includes a history of jobs, past and present, that caused exposures to inhaled particles such as dust, fume and mist, how the individual symptoms varied in time with such exposures, whether others were affected at work, and relevant hobbies Occupational asthma is asthma caused by sensitisation to an inhaled agent at work. It can cause an exacerbation of pre-existing asthma or new onset of adult asthma. Approximately 17% of adult onset asthma is likely to be caused by an occupational factor. There are a number of substances recognised to have the potential to sensitise individuals. If these are inhaled, i.e. are in dust, mist or fume form, they have the potential to cause occupational asthma. Employers have a legal duty of care to prevent employees becoming exposed to asthmagens. Generally speaking, they should do this by providing appropriate control measures to prevent exposure. This slide shows a typical extract ventilation provided for joinery work. Although atopy and smoking increase your risk of developing occupational asthma, generally speaking, the risk is related to how much substance the individual is exposed to. So in what sort of circumstances are people exposed to sensitizers in the UK? Workers spraying cars and other vehicles can be affected by a chemical called isocyanate, which can be found in two-pack paints. People who work in bakeries, flour mills and kitchens can develop symptoms to enzymes known as amylases in flour. Animal bedding, fur, feathers and dust can become impregnated with urinary aeroallergens which are sensitizers. This can affect people such as laboratory researchers, pet shop owners, stable workers and vets. Carpenters in joinery and furniture industries come into contact with dusts from hardwood, softwood and wood composite, particularly when wood is machined or sanded. People who work in the electronics and assembly industries come into contact with fumes from rosin-based solder flux. Engineers undertaking metal machining use a lubricant for the moving parts. These metalworking fluids are potential sensitizers. Farming is another industry with high levels of occupational asthma related to exposure to grains, dusts and animal era allergen. Historically, healthcare workers have come in contact with a number of potent sensitizers, such as the biocidal cleaning fluid used for endoscopes and powdered latex gloves. Both of these products are no longer in use. Hairdressers are exposed to a number of chemicals in bleach, dye, and perm solutions that can cause occupational asthma. Certain cleaning activities can cause asthma as a result of irritation from exposure to different chemicals. 
So these are some of the industries which are currently associated with high levels of occupational asthma if exposure to sensitizers is poorly controlled. However, industries change with time, new sensitizers can be created. It is important to have a high level of suspicion when certain elements of the history suggest an occupational cause. Occupational asthma causes a wheeze, cough and shortness of breath, much like any other asthma. But if this comes on in an adult with no past history of asthma, or there is a sudden significant deterioration in a previously well-controlled adult asthmatic, and you then find out that they work with a known sensitizer, you need to ask further questions. In particular, you need to ask about the presence of hay fever-like symptoms, such as a blocked, runny nose and sneezing, or watery, itchy eyes. Another key question is whether the symptoms seem to get better when they're away from work. Finally, you should ask if anyone else is affected with symptoms in the workplace. On the Web Learn site, you will find the British Occupational Health Research Foundation's case finding guidance that goes through these important questions. Diagnosing occupational asthma usually requires specialist input. In some cases, the individual produces a measurable IgE to the aeroallergen. The gold standard diagnostic test is challenge testing, which is undertaken in specialist units such as the Brompton Hospital. But before this, serial peak flows should be recorded and assessed over a matter of weeks to demonstrate the effect on peak flow of the workplace exposures. Under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, employees have a duty to report symptoms and health issues caused by work to their employer. This should lead to the employer reviewing the controls in place to exposure to asthmagens, but also if a case of occupational asthma occurs, they must notify the HSE. Employers should not be causing occupational asthma in their employees, so if they are notified of a case, they must take significant steps to identify how exposures occurred and how their workplace controls should be improved. If exposure to the causative agent ceases, symptoms usually resolve, but this may mean job loss for the individual. Some do try to control their exposure by use of masks and other ventilation, but this may still risk exposure and progression of symptoms. For occupational asthma and allergic rhinitis, there is the possibility of compensation. Health surveillance is required for work with asthmagens. Health surveillance is a system of ongoing checks that are required by law if an employee is exposed to a hazard at work and if a measurable health effect, such as early symptoms of occupational asthma, can be observed. We are now moving from airways disease to interstitial lung disease. Extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Extrinsic allergic alveolitis is a hypersensitivity pneumonitis caused by an extrinsic antigen, often a mould or a spore, that causes an allergic hypersensitivity response in the alveoli. Certain occupations and hobbies can put individuals at risk of this condition, particularly if the activity they undertake generates a lot of antigen-containing dust or mist. For example, a farmer digging a lot of mouldy hay in a poorly ventilated area puts himself at risk of inhaling large quantities of aspergillus spores. There are many causes of extrinsic allergic alveolitis. More can be read about this on the HSE website. But of the commoner ones, up to 5% of farmers experience symptoms in relation to mouldy hay, grain and straw. And up to 20% of those keeping birds experience bird fancier's lung, which is in relation to bird excreta and the bloom on their feathers. The symptoms are like a cold with fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath and aching. They classically occur about four to eight hours after exposure to large amounts of the antigen, and then may resolve within 12 to 48 hours. 
Over time, with ongoing exposure, symptoms will worsen and eventually become chronic, with dyspnea predominating. Again, diagnosis of this occupational disease is a complex and specialist matter. The condition is often confused in the acute stages with an infective process, as the individual may present with crepitations in their chest, raised neutrophils and a raised ESR. Generally speaking, high-resolution CT is a more reliable investigation than a chest X-ray. Once the diagnosis has been made, avoidance of the precipitating factor is essential, as this condition usually resolves but can lead to a progressive fibrotic condition of the lung. Sometimes steroids can be used. Once again, as with other occupational diseases, this condition may be eligible for compensation through the Industrial Injuries Compensation Board and should be reported to the Health and Safety Executive. Pneumoconiosis Long-term exposure to respirable particles of mineral dusts cause a fibrotic interstitial lung condition known as pneumoconiosis. Histologically, exposure to high volumes of coal mineral dust cause collections of coal-laden macrophages in the lung parenchyma and surrounding fibrosis and emphysema. The long latency of the condition means it often presents after retirement. It can also present like COPD or with a coexisting coal-related COPD condition. There may be a mixed restrictive or obstructive pattern of lung function. Treatment is supportive, although the individual should be advised to stop smoking. Respirable crystalline silica is found in stone, rocks, sand and clays. And occupations which expose an individual to this include quarrying, slate works, foundry work, pottery, stone masonry and construction when cutting or breaking stone, concrete or brick. Generally speaking, heavy asbestos exposures in the past are required to produce clinically significant asbestosis. There were nearly a thousand newly assessed cases of asbestosis for industrial injuries disablement benefit in 2014. The current trends, therefore, still largely reflect the results of heavy exposures in the past. This chronic pulmonary interstitial fibrosis presents with dyspnea, cough and in 40% of people, finger clubbing. It is significantly more rapidly progressing and severe in smokers. Chest x-ray changes show fine nodular shadowing, predominantly in the lower lobes. The gold standard test is lung biopsy, which shows interstitial fibrosis and asbestos bodies. A significant number of patients progress despite removal from exposure, and there is also an increased risk of non-mesothelioma cancer. It is a compensatable condition. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has identified numerous industries and exposures that are recognised to cause lung cancer. Despite this, only about 140 cases of occupationally caused lung cancer are notified per year. This is likely to be a significant underestimate, as once again, the occupational link is not always recognised. There are other occupational respiratory diseases that are not covered in this talk. Further useful links and reading resources are available on the Public Health Webland site under the Occupational Health section. But once again, I recommend looking at the Health and Safety Executive site to think about diseases related to certain occupations. So next time you see a respiratory condition, consider the individual's work, past and present, their previous exposures to dust, fumes, mist. Ask about the controls the employer used and think about whether that really would have controlled exposures. 
and think about the relationship of symptoms to the exposures. Ask if colleagues had health problems and if you're unsure, you suspect an occupational disease, refer to a specialist. There may be a legal requirement to report any conditions diagnosed and the individual may be eligible for compensation.